Our next speaker will be Kyle Cranmer. Uh, Kyle is a professor of physics at NYU and also an affiliate of NYU Center for Data Science. And he'll be speaking to us about um, experience with deep learning in particle physics. Great. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here um, and uh, continue with this thread about the impact of uh, deep learning and machine learning in the, in the physical sciences. Uh, for the last few years, I've really, this has kind of been the thing that's dominated my research is trying to understand this interplay between uh, what's emerging in terms of in machine learning and deep learning and uh, kind of traditional scientific uh, problems. And my, my own domain is coming from uh, particle physics, so I am a member of the ATLAS collaboration. Uh, this is a picture of the ATLAS detector. It's about the size of the auditorium we're in right now. This was when it was still being constructed. Uh, now it's full, uh, completely full of electronics. There are about 100 million electronic sensors. It acts essentially as a big three-dimensional camera that takes pictures of particle collisions that happen 40 million times a second. Okay, so it's producing one of the largest data sets in the history of science. Um, and uh, this is an example of what some of that data looks like. Uh, it's a little blurry on, on this right now, but uh, this is what mo most of the collisions look roughly like this. These are called jets, where uh, the particles come into collision and you get a spray of particles flying out that had to do with, for instance, quarks and gluons and things like this. So most of the collisions look like this. Um, occasionally we get a, a collision that looks like this. If you look uh, carefully, see if I can do the, the laser pointer. Uh, you see these four red lines. These are particles that were able to penetrate through this enormous detector, which is full of, you know, metal and all sorts of other uh, 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 material. So these, these four red particles, whatever they are, are unusual to be able to do that, and those, are, those particles are called muons, and they're, they're pretty rare, and to have four of them in one event is very, very rare. So we've had about a quadrillion collisions at the LHC, and we only have a handful of collisions that look like this. And that's uh, interesting because this is consistent with what you would expect if you made a Higgs boson. So when we first saw these kinds of uh, interactions, everyone was very, very excited. Um, uh, she was not excited. Everybody else was excited. Um, but she was not excited because she knew that you can't draw scientific conclusions from one, one picture like that and that you needed to work a little harder and do some statistical inference. So, uh, and as I try to connect the sort of particle physics or kind of science more generally, I'm going to do that through the language of statistics. And I think if you wanted to just broadly think about what we do as scientists, you know, there's sort of two big modalities. One is to make predictions where we want to predict what the data might look like or what the distribution of the data might look like based on the parameters of some theory. So over here on the left is sort of my theory, on the right is my data. And the other thing that we do is that once we've observed some data, we would like to do some inference about the parameters of those theories. Um, and I'm gonna sort of, it's useful sometimes to separate the parameters of those theories into two broad categories. There are parameters of interest. These are the things that I really want to know about, like the mass of some particle. Uh, and then there are nuisance parameters, which I don't necessarily care about, but I have to deal with. So for instance, these might be calibration constants of my detector, which are going to influence the distribution of my data, but I don't really care what the calibration constant is. Um, now, I'm writing down uh, the, a probability distribution for the data given those parameters, and I'm also going to introduce this idea of a latent variable, uh, Z, uh, and that latent variable is something that might happen inside of the simulation, but it's not something that I get to observe in my experiment. Okay, so uh, today I'm going to talk a lot about kind of well, these two directions and also put quite a bit of uh, uh, importance on the statistical inference side. So at the time of the uh, Higgs boson, you know, we were using machine learning in some details. It was not really what I want to focus on uh, so much. But in the end of the day, the way that we analyze the statistic, you know, statistically analyze the data was the same way we'd been doing it for a long time, which is essentially looking at histograms of what we predict from our theory and what we see in the data. And uh, this, uh, this crazy looking graph was the very complicated statistical model that we started to assemble for the Higgs. Um, and the reason that it became so complicated and why there's so many plots here is because there's lots of ways you can produce a Higgs boson, there's lots of ways it can decay. And so each one of these plots had a team of graduate students and postdocs that were going into trying to model what the data would look like. Um, and then we had to put it all together and we had to take into account the fact that if some part of the detector is miscalibrated, it's going to affect all of these plots. So it's an intricately uh, correlated system, and that's what this graph is encoding, and then this sort of turns into some mathematical formula. But this also looks kind of like a neural network. At the bottom, you have parameters of our theory and the data, 
and it propagates forward, and at the end we get a number, and that number in this case is an estimate of the likelihood of the data given the parameters of the theory. Okay, so, uh, so that worked pretty well. Uh, we ended up claiming you know, the discovery of the Higgs, but what I didn't uh, tell you at all about is how do, we, how do we make those predictions? How do we make those histograms, right? So at the beginning, you know, particle physics starts with, this is the standard model of particle physics. This is our incredibly concise description of fundamental building blocks of nature that's consistent with all the experiments we've thrown at it you know, to date. Um, and this is something I teach graduate students how to read. And from that, they learn the rules of, for instance, making these Feynman diagrams. And this little red graph is a pictorial representation of some joint probability distribution over these types of particles and what their energies and momenta are. Um, and that's something you can do on a pencil and paper with proper training. But the problem is I don't get to observe these particles. Uh, because they want to radiate more and more particles, and so we get this more complicated process, which I can't write down on it with a pencil and paper anymore. I, at this point, we put things on to computer simulations, and that continues on to a different type of evolution, which ends up finally with uh, these dark green blobs, which are sort of stable particles that are flying out into my detector. So this whole, this whole process in the inset is a very small microphysical process, um, but those green dots then fly out and hit our huge, you know, detector that's the size of this auditorium. Um, and so in the process of simulating that detector, we're literally tracing the paths of charged particles and as they ionize and decay and do all the things that they do, and they, you know, deposit some energy in our very big complicated detectors. So we simulate this whole process. Um, and, you know, there's been decades of work by, you know, hundreds of people to make this simulation chain. Um, and if you think about just this piece of the simulation chain, conceptually what it's telling you is the probability of the detector response given the incoming particles. So even if you had the same incoming particles and you ran the simulation again, you'd get a different detector response because it's probabilistic or stochastic in nature. Um, the way that we implement that in computer code is with a big, you know, Monte Carlo simulation, which is basically doing a huge integration over all the microphysical things that might have happened inside. And uh, the consequence of that is that the, while we can simulate in the forward direction, we cannot evaluate the likelihood. It becomes totally intractable because you would have to basically do this huge hundred million dimensional integral uh, for every observation, and that's not, not doable. Um, so, um, next. Um, so this motivates basically a new class of inference algorithms that only requires being able to run the simulation in the forward mode. So basically, if you can give me a simulator that will forward simulate, how do I do inference in that setting if that's all I can do? Um, and uh, so, um, so that idea is referred to as, uh, often referred to as likelihood-free inference. This is an area that started to you know, get some traction fairly recently. There have been some uh, workshops that were held in connection with the NeurIPS conferences, for instance. And I'm just gonna read a few things. So one you see again, it's a class of computational statistical methods for uh, Bayesian inference under intractable likelihoods. So this is what we're talking about. It's an important tool for a large and diverse segment of the scientific community, including systems biology, computational neuroscience, computer vision, healthcare sciences, they don't mention particle physics, but it should be on there. Um, uh, but one of the things that's also interesting is you see that it was basically developed under the radar of the machine learning community. So this is something that's coming really from the scientific community to solve the problems that scientists are, are running into. Okay. Now, one particular technique, which was essentially synonymous with likelihood-free inference until recently, is called approximate Bayesian computation, or ABC. And here's you know, an example paper that was early on uh, that's a, you know, one of the seminal papers there. And I'm just gonna highlight a few things. So one is the actual algorithm, which is fairly simple, and I can just kind of say it briefly, is that you pick the parameters theta of your, of your, theoretic, of your simulation, of your theoretical model, uh, according to some prior. And then based on those settings, you run your forward simulation and you get some synthetic data, that's D prime. Um, you also have some real data, D, and then you basically look to see how similar they are. So you need to introduce some sort of distance metric that says how similar is your real data from your synthetic data. And if it's uh, close enough, that, you know, less the, that, that distance is less than epsilon, then you're going to accept the simulation and you do that over and over again. And in the limit that epsilon goes to zero, this is an exact inference procedure. But if epsilon's bigger than zero, it's an approximate inference procedure. Okay, so that's how it works. Um, 
there's a, a point that's made here that says that when the data is high dimensional or continuous, this whole approach is, is, has some serious problems and you're going to need to introduce some sort of summary statistics, sort of like the fingerprints that we heard about or feature engineering to reduce the dimensionality of the data so that you can hope that this comparison might actually work. Uh, and then they, in the paper, they also go on to say that in practice, it's going to be hard, if not impossible, to identify the suitable uh, sufficient statistics. That means the ones that are not basically throwing away some information. Um, so we're going to probably have to resort to some heuristic approach. So this is sort of the status of ABC. It works. It's useful. But uh, you can see that there are some kind of holes uh, in it that we might want to improve. Um, so in particle physics, we don't refer to this term ABC, but it's very closely connected to what particle physicists do. So our data is very high dimensional. One collision has, you know, 100 million pixels in it. And then we have, uh, you use our physical insight to say, you know, if I'm looking for the Higgs boson, I kind of know a good summary statistic, and that's the axis of this plot. Um, and then you, you look at a histogram of this plot, and if we're making the Higgs boson, you would expect to see a bump, and indeed we do, and that's how we, you know, claim the discovery of the Higgs. But to do that required a lot of insight uh, into like specifically what it is that we were looking for um, and to be able to create this summary statistic. Um, and for the discovery of the Higgs, that wasn't so hard, but now we're moving to a new situation where we've discovered the Higgs and we want to study it in detail. And now we don't really have a good idea of a single su summary statistic or a good variable to plot that's going to reveal all the different ways that the Higgs boson might deviate from the simplest description that we have in the standard model. And this is like one of the highest value targets for particle physics right now is to study this. So here's a picture of some Feynman diagram that involves the Higgs boson. These are you know, taken from papers where people consider all sorts of angles uh, that, between particles and things. These are plots of those angles. And you can see that there's information hiding in the data in some you know, high dimensional, highly correlated way, and it's, very, it's not obvious how to proceed. Okay, so, um, around, so what's interesting, now I'm gonna kind of switch gears because I haven't said anything about really machine learning. So where does machine learning come in? Uh, the first interesting thing I'd say is that uh, the kind of breakthrough in deep learning which happened with these sort of, for instance, this ImageNet paper, at least uh, you know, I've learned earlier that you know, NLP was a little earlier, but okay, on the image side, this is sort of the, you know, the watershed moment for, for deep learning. That was the same month as the discovery of the Higgs boson, and it's amazing to see how much progress has been made in the field of deep learning while uh, us physicists are kind of trotting, trotting along because, uh, you know, nature is, nature is difficult. Um, but okay, so we're going to try to bring deep learning into the mix now. Um, okay, so... Um, so one thing that's interesting here is that within the machine learning community, there's been a, a lot of pickup of this, exactly this uh, uh, connection between the simulation and a lot of hot topics in machine learning. So for instance, generative adversarial networks, which I assumed would have been covered you know, 10 times by the time I got up here, uh, are a super hot topic. Uh, variational inference is a, a, a hot topic. Uh, these things are, are related to this problem of, of doing inference when you have intractable likelihoods. Um, so again, you see this, this uh, machine learning workshop where they're talking about you know, uh, simulators, and now at least they mention particle physics, so I've done my job. Um, and uh, and uh, so I'm gonna just say a little bit about these techniques, because now, uh, while before there was essentially only approximate Bayesian computation, now there's this whole slew of different approaches uh, to how to tackle this problem. And I'm gonna broadly uh, group them into two groups. One is approaches that use the simulator directly for doing inference, and others where you use uh, neural networks essentially to approximate or to learn the simulator. So let me, I already told you a little bit about ABC. Let me tell you a little bit about probabilistic programming. So in probabilistic programming, you're going to have your simulation code. So here's some code. I don't expect you to read it, but this code is randomly putting down little bumpers, and then it's dropping balls, and these balls are going to bounce around according to some physics model, and uh, they're going to do whatever they do, okay? Um, so, this is a, so you can think of this as describing a distribution over executions of this program, um, and so there are some examples, three examples. Um, now what I could do is say, what does the posterior distribution of the of this executions of this program look like conditioned on 20% of the balls ending in this box over here to the right? And like if you, if you just ran the simulator a lot, you'd have to run it many, many times to get, you know, a bunch of balls over here. But what's happening now is there's ability to basically control the simulation to try to force it or bias it to do what you want. And so here are some, you know, some examples where you get, you know, uh, balls in the box over there to the right. 
So now I can do the same kind of thing, like can I run my forward simulation of my physical process to try to make it look like the data more efficiently? And so we've been doing this kind of thing in the particle physics context. This is the first time I've seen probabilistic programming applied to like real world, you know, full scale scientific simulators. And the, basically the way it works is that we have to hijack, hijack the random number generators inside the simulation and we use a neural network essentially as a very fancy type of importance sampling uh, and, and we get outputs from the simulator that look like the real data. Um, this is computationally intensive. We've been doing things on supercomputers and et cetera. Um, but what's nice about this approach is it's as interpretable as the simulation was in the first place. You know, you can go in there and understand the full microphysical process that happened uh, for you know, why your balls ended up in the box over there on the right. Okay. Um, so the other approach that, that you know, broad class of approaches has to do with deep learning. So let me say a little bit uh, more there. Um, so here are some examples of these images made from generative adversarial networks. So there, here you see uh, birds and ants and monasteries and volcanoes. Uh, the results look much, much better now. You know, you see pictures of celebrity faces that just look, you know, very, very real. Uh, but, you know, this was, you know, this is some time ago, fine. Um, and uh, so there's this parallel now between something like a, a, a GAN, a generative adversarial network, that's taking random noise and producing outputs that look like you know, images from some distribution of volcanoes uh, to what the scientific simulator does, which is taking random you know, input and producing outputs that looks like the data that I you know, expect to see in my experiment. Um, so the, the difference is that this was you know, coded up by hand by a bunch of physicists, and this approach up here was learned using neural networks, right? But operationally, they're doing kind of the same thing. Um, so there's been some efforts, for instance, since these simulations are incredibly slow, and, uh, to try to speed them up by essentially just learning the simulation. Can you generate a bunch of data from your simulation, learn that distribution with a neural network, and then speed up the simulation a lot? If you can, that will be very useful in a number of uh, 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 circumstances because the computational budgets are sometimes our bottleneck. Um, uh, so the next thing that I'd like to move to is this idea of likelihood ratios from classifiers. So uh, classification is an area where, you know, where deep learning is doing very, very, very well. So if there's a way that we could leverage all the advances in classification and supervised learning uh, to do, solve this uh, inference problem, that would be useful. So uh, schematically, the way it's going to work is this. I have my simulator. It has some parameters, so like I say the masses of my particles and how they interact with each other or something like that. Um, I'm going to run my simulator and generate some synthetic data, um, and I'm going to have a neural network that's going to not only take a, the data as input, but also the values of those parameters. And then what its goal is going to be is to try to approximate a likelihood function or a likelihood ratio, which I will then later use for doing statistical inference. Um, this is a little bit hard because it's not normal function approximation because I don't know the likelihood function. It's, that's the intractable quantity. So I need to come up with a machine learn a loss function that I can operationalize so that what I end up learning is the, is, uh, plays the role of the likelihood function. So how do you do that? So here's a, just an example of a binary classification. I've got red dots and blue dots, and I want to try to learn a classifier to tell me, uh, you know, given a new dot, do I think it's red or blue? And, um, and so, the, so what you're looking for is, say, you know, some function, that's S here, where you give it the data X, and it's going to output a number between 0 and 1, where, say, 0 is red dots and 1 is blue dots. Um, so here is a loss function that I can construct. It's the squared loss. And you can show that the function S that minimizes this loss function is here. This is the Bayes optimal classifier. And this Bayes optimal classifier is just a one-to-one -one transformation of a likelihood ratio. And this is kind of the central thing that I need for doing statistical inference. So, so this is great. The problem is that this form of the loss function is the thing that I can't evaluate, but I can approximate it very well from simulations. So I don't need to know the actual probability distributions. I just need a bunch of red dots and blue dots. If I do that, then I can approximate the likelihood ratio of, you know, given some new dot that it's, you know, red versus blue. Um, so th this is a way that you can then use classifiers to essentially learn the likelihood ratio for doing statistical inference. Um, so, so we've done that, and then we've realized also that we can add more to it, because in addition to using the simulator to just output synthetic data, we realize that there are some tractable quantities that we can do. And, and there, I'm not going to go into the details, but there are connections to reinforcement learning and policy gradients and things like this, where you can basically see the simulator as a policy, and you can back propagate through this thing, and you can get some, uh, 
some quantities, which in, in uh, statistics you would call, for instance, the score or a joint likelihood ratio. And these kinds of uh, information that you can extract from the simulator uh, allows you to uh, train these neural networks much, much better and much more quickly. So here's a plot that shows how well are we approximating the likelihood function for some example where we have the ground truth um, as a function of the training size. And basically, the traditional approaches without neural network have some approximation error that's constant in this plot. Um, we have some uh, old techniques in green that required something like 10 million training examples before they started to do better than the traditional approaches, but then they would do much better. And now we have new techniques, which with as few as 10,000 training samples, we can do very, very, very well and approximate that the likelihood functions uh, very accurately. So in terms of Higgs physics, um, here's again some process that's describing making a Higgs boson that decays and the red dots indicate some new physics, which we're very interested in studying. Uh, this shows basically how well we're approximating the likelihood function. In this case, the data is 42 dimensional, so it's not super high dimensional, but it's fairly high dimensional. And here are kind of traditional scientific plots of log likelihood curves, where the minimum of this is the maximum likelihood estimate, and the curvature of this tells you something about the uncertainty in that quantity. And a steeper curve means a more precise measurement. And in the case of the LHC, this translates to adding basically twice as much, well, 90% more LHC data, which is, uh, you know, costs a lot of money. So this is definitely like improving, uh, improving science uh, for particle physics uh, substantially. Okay, so, um, so I'm going to just uh, sort of uh, g give a, a quick uh, takeaway from this part, and then I'm going to end with a couple other points. So the first takeaways I'd like to say is that, you know, I'm telling you about particle physics as a concrete example, but most of this translates to basically any scientific situation where you have a simulator. Um, so, so the points here are that many areas of science have these simulators uh, that are based on some mechanistic model that people kind of believe in and can interpret. Um, but the aggregate effects of all of the little interactions inside of your model lead to some very complicated, uh, you know, emergent properties. Um, and the, the sort of the likelihood of, or the statistical model for that, those macroscopic phenomena is intractable. So what it looks like is happening is that we can use these tools of machine learning to connect and come up with an effective description, an effective statistical model of the macroscopic phenomena that has emerged from microphysics and parameterize that in terms of the dynamics of the microphysical system. So it's really kind of connecting this microscopic, macroscopic divide and really saying something powerful about emergent, emergent phenomena and the underlying reductionist model. So I think this is very exciting. Um, so the last thing I'll, I'll say is that um, thus far I didn't really say anything about like the design of the neural networks. It was really the emphasis was about the simulation and the loss functions and how we're trying to use it to do statistical inference. So now let me say a little bit about the design of the networks and sort of what I call physics aware machine learning. So to motivate this a little bit, here's a slide from Max Welling. He's a very well-known guy in the machine learning uh, uh, field. Uh, he also, you know, was previously a physicist. Um, and he was talking about in machine learning that sort of two broad classes of models of discriminative and generative models. And, and, and you know, this is overly simplified, but, uh, um, but you see on the left you have deep learning. And there you see, you know, for instance, it's very successful in this kind of supervised learning paradigm. Um, but over here on the right are things that we would like as, as scientists. We want models that will allow us to inject our expert knowledge, to be able to model causal relationships, to be interpretable, to be data efficient, to be robust to domain shift, or what I would call systematic uncertainties. So all of these things are what I want, and deep learning is kind of over here. But they're, but they're not really mutually exclusive. There's, a, there's an intersection, which is a very exciting area. And for like deep learning and science, this is like where I would focus your attention, basically. Um, so just to give you some examples, this is not a deep learning approach. This is based on Gaussian processes. Um, but it's, uh, to me, is a motivational, which is the idea that the, 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 in the Gaussian process, there's an object called the kernel, which is basically the central object in those models. And there, you can come up with a sort of a, a grammar and a vocabulary uh, where you can compose these kernels together to where, such that they basically tell a story. And uh, this approach uh, allows you to be very, build models that are interpretable. Um, and uh, they, it's sort of a way of imposing uh, uh, the kind of implicit uh, bias that you would like on the uh, inductive bias on the models that have the sort of physics knowledge in them. And in a Gaussian process way, I sort of know how to do it. But how do you do this in a, uh, in a deep neural network sort of way? So there have been a few different approaches recently, which would take 
more time than I have to go into uh, very many details, but I'm just going to flash them. Uh, so here's a class of neural networks uh, that are, that where the structure of the neural network um, is given to you from algorithms that physicists have been studying uh, for decades. Um, and, and basically, these algorithms are sort of like a clustering algorithm. And what they do is they give you a scaffolding on which to pl place your neural network. So the information flowing through the neural network is sort of, has, uh, is sort of flowing along the right channels. And what's interesting is that this class of models has a, a lot in common with what's going on in natural language processing. So actually, a co-author of this paper is, is Kung Yan Cho, who's very well known in the natural language processing community. And here you see that actually we're, we're building this analogy between NLP and particle physics. So this is very, I mean, I think this is a really fascinating topic. There's another approach where we're using graph convolutional neural networks, where the adjacency matrix of this graph corresponds to something that as a physicist makes sense to me. And I can impose various symmetries. I can make sure that it behaves the right way under special relativity and all the kinds of things that I want it to do. Um, and, and so I, and once I train the model, I can extract that, that quantity, this adjacency matrix, and I can interpret it totally outside of the context of deep learning and even use it for a different task. So this idea of being able to inject or extract information from a deep neural network is, is like a, just a curious example. And I'd like to see you know, collect more examples like this in the hopes that some, some kind of general principles emerge. Um, the last one I'll show is this is a generative model, but instead of being like a GAN, where the forward model is just a sort of a, a neural network that doesn't know anything about physics, here it's a, a, a generative model that's a, for the, those in the know, a more, it's an autoregressive type of model, but it's, it's operating over this tree-like structure, and what it's trying to do is trying to model the process of the radiation that leads to this complicated jet. And the nice thing is that not only does it describe the distribution of the observed data, I can also go inside, inside the model that where there's some latent thing going on, like the, the generative model that's actually making, that physically means something, and I can inspect what's going on. So like pick that particular node, I can look at a plot, and I can compare that, what the neural network is doing to my traditional scientific simulator, and I can see that even inside the latent process that's going on, there's agreement between the neural network and the scientific simulator. And that is like, that to me is very, very uh, compelling. Okay, so then I'll end with this, is that uh, our, I think our understanding of how to leverage you know, our prior physics knowledge or just domain knowledge in general into these machine learning architectures is sort of just getting started, it's maturing quickly. Uh, there's various efforts, you know, physicists are skeptical, so there's a lot of efforts about how do we build in robustness to systematic uncertainties, how do we inject and extract, you know, whatever domain knowledge into these models, how do we exploit symmetries, uh, hierarchical structure, compositional structure uh, in the networks, um, and that is all moving very quickly, and so uh, I think, you know, uh, it's a very exciting time, uh, and, uh, and then the last point is that, you know, to really harness the full power of machine learning is going to require deep integration of all of this into our scientific uh, software pipelines, and that's going to require investments and a lot of uh, retooling, um, and it also influences things like uh, reproducibility and et cetera. So, um, so the, you know, the, the impact of this is not just on the science side, it's also very much in the practical side of how we actually execute the science. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kyle. Uh, I think we'll have time for maybe one question. How much of prior physics knowledge can one reproduce with deep learning? Um, so, if, so there's different kinds of prior knowledge that you might want to uh, impose. Sometimes it might be very strict, like you know that a certain symmetry or conservation law needs to be held. And then there are, very, there are a number of techniques that are being developed now to impose that structure on the neural network so it doesn't have to learn, for instance, energy is conserved, energy conservation is like built into the network. So that's one approach. Uh, the other approach is where you really, you're giving it more of a, a general kind of, you're giving it the right structure. You're not telling it the functional form, you're just saying that the model kind of decomposes in a certain way, it's com it has some compositional structure, or I know that this thing over here is independent from that thing over there. Um, and so th those kinds of, but that can be very, very powerful. Because if you just start in general with anything can be correlated to anything, you need a lot more data um, and you have a lot more opportunities to make a mistake. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you again.